Um, I think it's a flaw that leads to a lot of tragedy, but I don't think it is his tragic flaw. I think um, a lot of people would probably find his situation just as difficult. So I think it's something that a lot of people could empathise with. So I don't think it's like an inherent badness or uh, drawback of him. But it's something that if he could have got over it earlier, we would have a much shorter play. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs>
I think genuinely between the two of them, they love their country. Uh, yeah, I was. Um, and I remember the first time we rehearsed the to be or not to be speech. Um, I didn't even know we were going to do it. So it was, so you get given the call list of your rehearsal schedule. And we, we, I'd been called in to rehearse the nunnery scene, which is um, Hamlet and Ophelia. And to be or not to be happens to be like just before that scene. So we sat down and started talking about the nunnery scene and then the director was like, okay, go on. Actually, no, we'll go from the start, the top of the scene. <laughs> I'm like, what, from to be or not to be? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> so like the first time you do it, you, you feel rubbish and you feel like you don't understand anything and you're like, oh, it's the most impenetrable bit of language ever, but um, you rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and you eventually become a bit more relaxed to you. More so than with any other character than I've played, because I, like, I'm, I, like, um, controversial, I'm a bit sceptical about the um, whole idea of people becoming characters and not being able to, like, think as themselves or anything. I think there's always going to be an element, because, I mean, you're an actor playing a part, so I'm a bit sceptical about that, but that's just me. But more so than with any other character, with Hamlet, I find myself getting lost in his thoughts and his actions and his journey, because it is so momentum-bound that once you get on this kind of like freight train that is this guy's life, it's really difficult not to find yourself getting invested in it. <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I find myself kind of like, I remember in the weeks just before we started, I'd be dreaming um, his lines all the time, like 24 <laughs> seven, this guy's, my, it was on my mind, you know? So it, it's a, it, I, I think any actor that plays that part will admit it's all encompassing and you have to put a hundred percent of yourself into it for you to even get under the first layer of the character. So yeah. yeah. It's quite hard because like for me like all the scenes are pretty hard. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're all quite difficult. And and some of them are more, it kind of varies from night to night. Some one night the nine we scene will be really easy, but the closet scene will be really hard and the next night it'll be completely um, the opposite. Um, so, yeah, they've all got their own virtues and their own potential traps, and it's about just trying to navigate your way through this uh, three-hour minefield without getting the leg blown off. But I usually find um, the final scene quite difficult, which is like a combination between the fact that there's a lot of things happening, um, you're nearly at the end, so <laughs> you, can see, like, the, you can see the finish line, but it's, it's quite important not to play the end before you get to the end. But when you're quite tired after doing three or maybe six hours of Shakespeare, it's sometimes you're like, oh, you, you can give in to that temptation. So it's quite difficult to maintain that um, discipline. You know? Yeah. It sounds really weird, but like, because I mean, some people stay at home and they just like they they put um, they record them and listen to them and walk when they're falling asleep, listen to them or whatever. And like, I, I mean, everyone does it to an extent, but for me, lines only really properly go in when I start doing it. So when we start rehearsing scenes and we start thinking about what those lines mean and why we're saying those lines and what we're trying to do with those lines, that is actually what is my brain is logging. Mm. It's not logging the, the literal to be or not to be. It's, I don't have like a script going through my um, subconscious going like that. I'm thinking about wh what do I want from this person? Okay, that makes that that is, is the stimulus for me to say this next line. So that's how I learned. Um, if it was badly written, you wouldn't remember them. Yeah. It's so well written that, as Papa was saying, that one, it's not about a line; it's about a thought, an idea, and you say one, and because it's so perfectly formed then the next thought comes in and connects to that thought and the other and the other and the other. And it just is so fluid in his writing at times. And there are technical bits that you do have to sit down and go, right, I'm going to learn this bit. But I'm sure Papa would agree that with something like to be or not to be, once you start communicating that idea, it's such a fantastically deep and dense 
but yet simple idea that you just, the words just come like they're your own. And um, yeah, that's, that, that's how I learn them. They're, as I said, there are elements that you might have to do a little bit more work, but mostly, you know, they, they're there. He's great for that. Um, I think, well, I guess the, the, the language is difficult to, to describe exactly what he, what he is. But I think there's elements of both. There's definitely an assumed madness. He says that he's going to put on an antic disposition, and he very logically kind of puts forward that idea and, um, act, and does it and acts it. So it does definitely begin from that point, but I think he does spiral into um, a feeling and an uh, atmosphere of franticness and um, g g g volatile, volatility and um, rashness which a lot of people uh, people could describe as a type of madness but I think the one thing that is absolutely um, synonymous with him is a man a young man suffering from a deep deep grief <laughs> yeah the trauma that kind of the trauma and the shock that comes as a result of that my idea Hamlet is um, a young man and a student kind of still forming his identity and forming his idea of what the world is like. You know? So um, it's really useful for this play because it, there's a clear split in between the Hamlet that you don't see just before the start of the play and the Hamlet that you do see during the play and there needs to be a big shift in between those two sides and facets of his character so it's really useful to have that as something to build from to begin with. Um. I would describe Claudius as really, at heart, a genuine good man who has chosen to do the things that he does in this play for the right reasons, i.e. he does it because he believes it's the best thing to do for the country. And um, he feels that the old Hamlet, his brother, um, is basically like the old guard. It's like the old regime, old and traditional, whereas now they're moving into the 21st century rather than the 19th century. So um, he, he, he does what he does, as I said, because um, we need to bring our people, our country, into the modern age. those things come one on top of the other you know I think that's the thing he gets overwhelmed by this huge seismic change in his world so his dad dies he has to come back to this country that he's kind of um, thinking about whether he wants to spend his future there or not and then he sees his mum and his mum is with his uncle and there's a whole shady situation about how his dad has died and anything so I think it's one th one bad it's like when it rains, it pours, you know, and like he's absolutely drenched. His antic disposition is a part of a plan in order to get some sort of um, definite answer. So he's seen, he's seen his father's ghost, right? And his father's told him something very, given him some very volatile information that's not going to stand up in court and that can't actually really properly stand up in the court of his own mind, his own brain. So he needs physical evidence proof in order to do that. The thing about the antic disposition is that it kind of gives you license to ask questions that you otherwise couldn't ask or to do things that you otherwise couldn't do. No one su suspects the mad guy, you know? So Claudius has already been like, oh, you're acting all unmanly because you're crying all the time. Why are you always wearing black and all this? Um, so he's already, he, like, he, he already, Claudius is already underestimating him. And I think the antic disposition only serves to further that in order for him, for Hamlet to really be able to pierce Claudius and observe Claudius and push Claudius into a position where if he is guilty, that he'll be able to find that out.
So when we were thinking about where we were going to set the production, um, there were actually a lot of different influences. What we tried to do from a very early stage is to create the Elsinore that we set our play in. And we allowed lots of different influences to create that world. So there were influences from Ghana, influences for the Car from the Caribbean, European influences, Elizabethan influences. So we kind of created this kind of hodgepodge of hot pot of um, lots of different uh, cultures. And I went to Ghana for Christmas just before we started rehearsals and I was asking those questions and asking what people thought of the, about the play and ghosts and all that kind of stuff. And it's so interesting when you talk about how palpable the, the connection to the supernatural is when you leave Europe, you know, or when you leave our kind of idea of our society. Um, when we talk about ghosts, we um, think about goosebumps or like really, really dodgy, like hidden camera shows, you know. But like in other parts of the country, it's a real thing, and it has to be like that in this play. You have to. Hamlet believes that he's he's seen the father as ghost. So what happens? He goes on the battlements and he talks to Horatio and Bernardo and Marcellus, and they say, "I saw your father's ghost last night." He doesn't say, "What really? Did you?" No, no, you didn't. He just says, "Where." We wanted to create a world that was recognisable and a world that people could relate to and something that was a hamlet for our times, for now, you know? So there's a bit where like, I walk out wearing like uh, Air Max 90s <laughs> because that's what he would wear nowadays. And like, I just think that's useful. It's a useful tip in the ha of the hat to make people realise that this is a story that is timeless and a story that is universal. And it doesn't have to be a 1600s kind of like um, doublet and ho hose thing. It's something that we still go, go through. We still go through jealousy, we still go through love, we still go through death, we still go through grief. Um, these are things that everyone can relate to and that's what's so brilliant about that story. So that's why it was a really important production for me to be a part of because I think that it's important that people know about that. Let me just explain the kind of setup to the nunnery scene. So, I mean, we have a very, 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 we, we like we, me and Ophelia, or me and Natalie, thought it was useful for us to begin with a very, very close and loving relationship. And then, in the scenes before the nunnery scene, there's a scene with Ophelia and her dad, when her dad comes and says to her, "You've got to break up with Hamlet. You've got to break up with him," and she says, "Yeah." So she comes. Bearing in mind, my dad's just de died, and my mum's just married my uncle, so I'm already in the slightly, like, not the most calm state. She comes and says, I'm oh, sorry, I'm breaking up with you as well. So it's one thing upon the other, upon the other. So um, that in itself is a betrayal, but in the nunnery scene, she cuts, so I mean, it starts off as a breakup scene. She comes and she says, she's like, here's all your stuff, you just take it back. And I'm like, oh, but I, 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 I did love you once. And she was like, you made me believe so. And I was like, oh, no, I didn't love you. So, I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit of a petulant argument. But then there was a very, very important moment in the middle of the scene where something happens behind an arras, right? And Hamlet realises that there's someone else in this room, all right? It's, it's not just Ophelia. So he puts two and two together and realises that Ophelia must be in cahoots or must be, as like have agency as part of a bigger plan involving other people, would be it Polonius, be it Claudius, and that is the biggest betrayal that he can imagine. The one person or one person or two people, her and Horatio, but one of the only people that he thought that he could trust till the day he died is actually on the other team. You know, and like that is a betrayal that I think he finds very, very difficult to digest quickly, which is why it kind of explodes this quite aggressive scene. The play within the play is performed and Claudius reacts in a very quite obvious way to being presented with this um, mirror image of what actually happened in terms of the murder, which Hamlet says, okay, cool, that's proof. So now I can kill him. And then he gets into a point where he's got a gun in his hand, right? And he's got the opportunity to kill Claudius. He's there, he's praying, we can't see him. But then he's about to do it, and he thinks, right, actually, he's praying. So if I kill him now, he'll go straight to heaven, and he'll live forever in bliss, whereas my dad is still in hell burning because he didn't get a chance to pray before um, he, before he was murdered. And there's a line that's actually been cut from our um, version 
in that in a speech where he says, "This is not revenge, but this is higher in salary," you know. So Hamlet wants it to happen in the perfect way for it to be an eye for an eye. So he doesn't want Claudius to be killed and go to heaven. He wants him to go to hell where he belongs. So that's why that's another reason why you could call it indecision, but I think he's more just trying to get the job done in the right way. We talk about his antic disposition and his madness, right? I think Ham I don't think Hamlet is mad. I think he's someone who's uh, who's displaying symptoms of deep, deep grief and kind of post-traumatic shock as a result of that. But he's also getting into this real franticness. So the antic disposition kind of melts into this real kind of like high energy, high intensity, very, very reactive and volatile um, um, man. And so he sees something going on behind the IRS, bang, shoots it. Does it, it, it turns out it wasn't Claudius, it was his girlfriend's dad. I'll deal with that later, go straight back onto his mother and really, really hammering that up point home. So I think he's wor he feels like he's, he's, he's working at a very high intensity and, and, and everything is high stakes. Um, there is remorse for what he's done and hopefully you see that towards the end of the scene where he says, I'll bury him um, and I will repent for what I've done, I'll own up to it. And when he sees the impact of what that does to Laertes and to Ophelia later on in the play, it really, really does affect him. But at this po at this particular point in the play, I think he's just got he's got some his mind is so so hell bent on getting his jo getting the job done that he hasn't got time to digest that action, even though it's huge. Well, I say, well, it could have been me if I was there. <laughs> I think that um, I think at that point he realizes that he's going to have to kill Hamlet because otherwise Hamlet will kill him. But more importantly, even if he doesn't physically kill him, he will be killed by reputation. He'll be killed because he will be discovered. We came up with the idea that Yorick was the equivalent of like his nanny, his male nanny or whatever. Like, but like the guy who, as he was growing up, was always there, always there, like best friend in the world. And so the idea of seeing the skull of someone that you loved is a really, really kind of like mind bending thing. But it makes him, it kind of really, really makes him um, take uh, ad ad address full on the hugeness of fa of death and mortality and almost like <laughs> the futility of a lot of the things that we do and he says where are your jokes now who are you making laugh now and then he says do you think a man as great as alexander the great looks just like this when they're dead and horatio says yeah he says to what great to what base uses we must return Horatio so that's a really really kind of beautiful moment but then you have the duel or in our version the stick fight where so and so tries to pose it poison so and so and like someone's got uh, anyway it just it's, it turns into a bloodbath and his mother gets killed as part of a plan that goes wrong his mother gets poisoned and the kind of gut wrenching reaction to that is what actually pushes him into a, a motion of action where he can actually finally do what he set out to do at the beginning of the play and kill the king, which he does. And then he dies. But he dies.